All right, looks like we have a good crowd already. So thank you for spending Thursday night talking about ETFs. Before we get started, anything you hear today is general advice. Obviously, don't know anything about you. I can't offer personal advice, but questions are always appreciated. So if you have any questions, pop them into the chat or the Q&A. And tonight, we're going to talk about Morningstar's ETF model portfolios, and then also how you can use ETFs to hopefully help your own portfolio. So we will go ahead and get started and yeah, just shoot any questions you have. Okay, so first, just a little bit of an explanation about what are the Morningstar ETF model portfolios, and of course, more importantly, how you should actually use them. So what they are is they are a set of five diversified model portfolio. So basically what we do is we take our strategic asset allocation. So a strategic asset allocation is a long-term asset allocation. So for anyone who joined the earlier webinar today that talked about goals, when we're trying to build a portfolio, we establish our goals, we figure out the return we need to achieve that goal. And then of course we use that as an input into our asset allocation. So these five strategic asset allocations go from everything from uh, conservative up to aggressive. So basically the higher return that you need and the longer the time period you have to invest, the more you want to allocate into growth assets. So what we do is we take those strategic asset allocations and then we basically line up ETFs against that and of course allocate to those individual ETFs, and obviously this will make more sense when I show it to you, but based on those broader categories that you're looking for going from those aggressive portfolios back to those conservative portfolios. So what are you supposed to do with this? Well, at the end of the day, what these ETF model portfolios are, it is 14 different ETFs. So these are ETFs that are analysts rate highly. And investors may want to choose to replicate the entire portfolio. I'll talk about some of the considerations there. But many investors might want to have a more simplified version of a portfolio and use these 14 ETFs as, as a starting off point for their own research. And some investors may want to use an ETF to get a certain allocation they're looking for in a portfolio. So a very simple example would be, a lot of investors that certainly follow us on Morningstar are very interested in Australian shares. Maybe for the Australian shares portion of their portfolio, they might want to go out there and pick individual shares, perhaps. And then they don't want to do that with global shares, a little harder to access. Perhaps you don't know the companies as well. The information is harder to get. So maybe you'd use an ETF for that. But either way, this is a good starting off point for a list of ETFs that our analysts do, uh, do like, and hopefully can be used as an input into your own investment process. All right, so we're gonna take a look at the aggressive ETF model portfolio as an example to walk through this. Now, if anyone does want the ETF model portfolios, it's of course available to our Morningstar investors, subscribers, it's updated every quarter. If you would like to get a copy of the report, you can send me an email, mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. It is the email address that, uh, that I believe this invite was sent to. It should be in those invites. Um, you can shoot me an email and ask me for that. I won't get it to you tonight. I have to go to dinner after this, but I can send it along tomorrow. So as an example. So this is what I'm talking about. The first thing we're doing is we're lining it up with asset allocation. And you can see in this case, we're looking at the aggressive. So this is the ETF model portfolio with the largest allocation to growth assets. So remember, those are assets where you would expect higher long-term returns. There would be more volatility, things like shares, listed property, infrastructure. And you can see because of that volatility, we are recommending that you do have a longer time horizon. Um, for these, you can see a minimum nine year time horizon. And you can see, as I just said, 90% is allocated to growth assets and 10% obviously to defensive assets like fixed interest and cash. You can see right here, 
this is the asset allocation. This is the same asset allocation we provide as part of Morningstar Investor for this aggressive portfolio. And then as we go down to the other portfolios, all the way down to conservative, of course, we will allocate more to defensive assets as we get more defensive. And then the other thing that I, uh, that I added in here is just you can see the sector weighting of this portfolio. And we'll take a look at the ETFs in a second, but I just wanted to sort of form that foundation um, before we get started. So you can see of the different sectors, there are 11 different sectors that shares are divided up into. You can see how it's actually allocated into those different sectors. That would be, of course, if you purchased all of the ETFs um, in, uh, in this portfolio. All right, so what are these 14 ETFs? that are in there. So you can see in the left-hand column, um, we have the name of the ETF, and then we've got the ticker symbol. And really, in terms of classifying ETFs, what you can see is there are, of course, passive ETFs. So a passive ETF replicates an index. We have active ETFs. So an active ETF, a manager is out there. You can see there's two of them, these two Magellan ETFs the infrastructure and the global. Those are active ETFs, so a portfolio manager is making a decision. And then while this is not an official definition, a factor ETF. So basically a factor ETF is an ETF where we are trying to do something specific with that portfolio. Now that specific thing we're trying to do can either be one, um, looking at the weighting that we use, for the individual holdings in the ETF, and I'll go through an example in a second, or it can be trying to select specific securities, and these generally track indexes, but they're index rules, selecting specific securities um, that meet a certain criteria. So it's looking at characteristics of those underlying shares and then trying to identify them to go into the ETF. So a couple of the factor examples, and these are two good examples. We've got this beta shares product here, uh, ticker symbol QOZ. And what this is doing is it is weighting the ASX 200 differently. Same thing with this Vanek equal weighted ETF. And this one is trying to weight securities by the fundamentals instead of the market capitalization. And the theory behind this is, and I'm just using these as examples of what a factor ETF is, the theory behind this is that, of course, shares that become overpriced will generally make up more of a market capitalization weighted index. So market capitalization refers to the size of a company as measured by its market value. So it's the number of shares outstanding times the share price. So if that share price keeps going up, a share becomes a bigger and bigger part of the index. So if you look at the ASX 200, you think, oh, there's 200 shares in there. Well, that's great. But 10% of the index is allocated to one share, BHP. So this fundamental index is trying to look at other factors, fundamental factors around the company, earnings, cash flow, et cetera, to try to weight those equal weighted. We are, of course, putting an equal amount of money in all 200 shares. Whereas a market cap, very, very top heavy, especially in Australia, this would allocate to all 200. So those are examples of factor ETFs. Another factor ETF that we'll actually spend some time on, I'm doing a bit of an example, is this Vanek Miski International Quality. In that case, we're looking for quality shares. And that's based on the characteristics of those companies. And I won't go through that right now because we are gonna spend some time on it. But you can see that we do have these 14 different ETFs in here. Now, within individual categories, and this is where investors really need to come up with a portfolio, and we'll go through an example of this, come up with a portfolio that is aligned to your goals. And within categories like your equity allocation, there are of course different types of equities. There are large shares, big companies, right? High market capitalization. There are small shares, small companies. They have different characteristics. So we do have um, we do have a small cap, two small cap ETFs in here. 
um, for people that are interested in that. We have emerging markets as part of our international allocation. But some investors may want to go for simplicity. So once again, I would say that really what the point of these portfolios is not, and you could do this if you want to, not necessarily to replicate it and have 14 ETFs in your portfolio, but sort of pick and choose those exposures you want to get. Um, and if you are an investor that does want emerging market exposure, small cap exposure, both which are generally more volatile than the overall market. So these are the shares throughout those five different ETFs based on the different um, based on the different characteristics of the portfolio and the allocation between growth and defensive assets, you'll see a mix of these different securities. So that will be in that, um, in that document for anyone that wants to, wants to request that. You see the asset class, so I've listed the asset class um, that each one of these are in. I try to add a little detail rather than just going high level growth and defensive. And then of course I put in the fees as well. So the things that will obviously jump out at you are active ETFs charge significantly higher fees than passive ETFs. Of course you need to pay for all the people that are making those decisions on what to buy and what to sell. You'll see a lot of factor ETFs generally have higher fees than what you would get for just following an index. Um, so fee level is really important and we'll go through that. We'll go through that example as we walk through the process. Okay. Before I get there, there are a couple of questions that I can, um, that I can get to. Um, so let's see, what do we have? Okay. We've got a question on bear ETFs, um, which is a good one. So Jim, uh, so Jim answered that question. So I'm happy to go through any sort of general ETFs. I'll do these questions quickly before we walk through the process. Um, so basically what a bear market ETF is, is it is an ETF that is supposed to go up when the market goes down. Of course, when the market goes up, that ETF will go down. A couple of things to think about with bear ETFs. And generally what there are, there are bear ETFs with um, the degree of uh, the degree that they will move inversely to the market. So you certainly have just a regular bear market ETF that should do the opposite of what the market does. And then you can multiply that out by it will go down or it will go up two times what the market goes down. A couple of things to worry about. Um, a couple of things to worry about with a bear ETF is that they generally will not work perfectly. So even though they are supposed to go up by a multiple when the market goes down, they will not exactly do that. They will, of course, move in the opposite direction, but it will not be perfect um, because there are certainly difficulties in that. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other thing to think about with a bear market, <coughs> sorry, a bear market ETF is that the market mostly goes up over the long term, of course. So you'd only want to use these for very specific circumstances um, and just be careful on how you use those. So just something to think about. Okay, so we do have a question saying there is no U.S. index in there. That is true. Um, let's talk about international investing. So the main ETF that is in here tracking a passive large index is this Vanguard Miski International Hedged ETF. If you look at overall global markets, the U.S. makes up something, some around 70% of global markets. So don't quote me exactly on this, but this, uh, this Vanguard Miski International is about 70% U.S. So you're getting a lot of exposure to the U.S., if you're just investing in a quote unquote global ETF. Um, so that's really where you're getting your US exposure. There's other global ETFs, Magellan Global, of course. Um, this quality ETF is heavily exposed to tech. It's the one that we we'll use as an example. So it's heavily exposed to the US. So you are getting plenty of US exposure in here. Um, but no, there is not a specific ETF tracking the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or things like that. Got a question, would you email those slides after the webinar? Only if you'll email me, because that's the only way that I'll know your email address. But yes, I'm happy to uh, 
happy to um, email these. Okay, got a couple other questions which I will get to, but let's uh, let's move on. Talk a little bit about how you want to select an ETF from your por for your portfolio, whether you are using something that's on that list or whether you are, uh, thank you, Rodney, he's at Qual 75% US. Um, so that is an example of another example of exposure you're getting to the US. All right, so this all starts, and I won't go through, obviously, all the details, but before you can go out there and select investments, you do need to have an idea of what your goals and investment strategy is. So very simply, and I won't go through the details because I did it in an earlier webinar, we want to use a goal as a foundation for what we're doing. So what a goal is, is just defining how much money you need, when you need it. It allows you to calculate the return you need, and that's a key input into asset allocation. So very simply, if I have a portfolio that's 100% shares, that is a very different risk and return profile than if I have 100% cash. And those are obviously extremes. But how do you make those decisions? Well, you should be making those decisions on the return that you need to achieve. You need an 8% return. It shouldn't be 100% cash, right? You'll just never make it there. You only need a 2% return. You have a lot of money. You're approaching retirement. You've already hit your goal. Well, then maybe you don't want to be 100% allocated to equities. So we do want to start with goals. And then basically an investment policy statement. And I know that, you know, this is a term that's typically used by financial advisors, investment professionals, but we want to have structure when we're investing. And the investment policy statement just outlines, and it does not need to be long. It can be a couple sentences. It just outlines what you're trying to accomplish. So for instance, your investment policy statement could be, hey, my goal is to generate income. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to buy securities that would have high current dividend yields, would grow their dividends at above the market rate. And that can inform then what you're actually going to select, right? So you probably wouldn't go out there and pick a small cap US ETF because they uh, because small caps generally have lower dividend yields, right? So it's just something that informs and kind of breaks down this huge universe of securities we can go out there and select and talks about the criteria that you're going to use to actually select them. And I think that this last line is pretty important. There is no right or wrong way to invest. We get sold all the time by investment professionals that you need to be a value investor, you need to be a growth investor. Well, there are lots of different ways of investing that work, but what doesn't work is switching back and forth between all these different approaches and trying to be nimble and trying to pick what's going to perform the best over short periods of time, because chances are you'll get it wrong and you'll incur transaction costs, and capital gains and everything else that is bad and detracts from your returns. So step one to select the ETF, know your goals and your investment strategy. All right. This allows us to narrow down the universe of ETFs. You can see there are 278, around 278 ETFs that are available on Australian exchanges. That is a lot. And of course, the challenge for all of us, is how do I pick which one of these 278? Well, the way that you do that, of course, is going through this structure, the structure of defining your goals, writing about what, how you're going to accomplish those goals, what's the investment approach you're going to take. And then when we start thinking about ETFs, don't get overwhelmed, start thinking that, okay, what is that exposure that I'm trying to get in my portfolio? You say, I'm looking for global equities. Well, all of a sudden that narrows down that list. And that's really what we're trying to do with this ETF model portfolio, with these ETF model portfolios, and what we're trying to do with the research by our analysts, saying, okay, well, here's a couple for you to choose from. And we'll talk about how you actually do that. Um, so yeah, think about either the asset allocation, I'm trying to get global equity exposure. Think about a certain attribute. I'm trying to invest in high dividend payers. I'm trying to invest in um, quality companies, which is the example we'll use in a second. Think about that kind of attribute that you want to put in your portfolio and why. Why is that something that's attractive for you to put in your portfolio? All right, so now we're actually selecting an ETF. So there's three steps that we're going to walk through, and we'll use 
We'll use a real example for these. Fees are very important. I will say, maybe I'm going off the reservation a little bit by saying this, I would never buy either one of those Magellan ETFs. I just would not pay those fees. Um, so to me, that's an outrageous fee. Um, that's my own criteria, of course. Those actively managed ETFs would have to significantly outperform the market in order for them to outperform the market on an after fee basis. Um, so use fees as a criteria. And then these two examples we're gonna talk through, the criteria for security selection. So what we mean here is what is in the ETF and how are they picked? Now with an active manager, you want to, of course, evaluate the people and the process they're going through in order to select those securities, right? And that can be very hard. It's what our analysts do. They spend time meeting with the portfolio managers. They spend a lot of time looking at data, looking at their track record. Um, that's really analyzing the people. But even if you're investing in a passive ETF, especially if you're investing in a factor ETF or a thematic ETF, you want to know why certain securities go in there and how it's actually weighted. So a very simple example is if you bought an ASX 200 ETF, you should know that these are the 2200 largest companies in Australia by market capitalization, which we talked about before. You should know they are weighted by market capitalization. So you're gonna get a lot of exposure in a top heavy market like Australia to the largest shares in the index, you're gonna get very little exposure to even the bottom 100 shares in that index. So you should understand that. And the reason we wanna understand that, of course, is we want to understand why the ETF is performing, how it performs. Because a lot of investors just go off of performance. And if you can't come up with a reason or understand why something is performing the way it is, well, that's a problem. So very simply, if we look at Australia, if we look at the ASX 200 and a really, really top heavy um, index like Australia, well, you know, at the end of the day, 190 of the shares in the ASX 200 could do pretty well. If the top 10 do really poorly, that ETF and that index are going down. And we've seen that in the U.S. this year. So the U.S. is not as top heavy as Australia, but still very much dominated by large tech shares. And during the first half of this year, those tech shares rallied significantly. So you might have heard this term, the magnific Magnificent Seven. So it's all the ones you probably can start naming uh, NVIDIA and Google or Alphabet and Meta, Facebook's owner, and Microsoft. So the U.S. market had a really, really strong first half of the year, but the average share in the U.S. didn't do very well. That index was dragged higher by those seven shares. That's really where we want to understand, even if we are investing passively, how those indexes are made up. And then this third step, and we'll go through an example of all this, the ETF composition. So we can look at the criteria. The criteria is the 200 largest shares in Australia, CASX 200. It is market cap weighted. Okay, so I know bigger companies are gonna have more of an influence on that index, but we also wanna see how does that actually play out in real life? We wanna look at what that portfolio looks like. And so, I've talked about it a little bit today. How does that play out in Australia? Well, BHP is a huge company. It is 10% of the index. The banks are really big. Um, they're really large parts of the index. So you just want to understand, okay, how does this actually, when this gets applied to real life, what does this actually look like? All right, so let's go through an example. And then there will be plenty of time for the question. So I picked this Banek um, quality ETF. So the ticker symbol is QUAL, Q-U-A-L. And what this is looking at is it is looking at global shares. So we're not including any Australian shares in this. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify companies that have components that investors consider as quality. So I lifted this from our analyst report. And obviously, I'm a little bit biased here. But 
I think our analysts do a good job of describing the criteria and what the implications are, but you can do this yourself. So all this information is available. So in this case, if you go on to Vanex website and you look at the index that this thing is tracking, remember, even though this is a factor ETF, it's tracking an index. The index has rules, just like the ASX 200 has rules. This index, you can see the Miski World X Australia Quality Index, it has rules to decide what actually gets put in here. And so our analysts summarize this, but all of this is available. All of this is available on, and they have some opinions in here, but just these peer rules that are used to select what goes in here, all available on the next website. You might have to go through a couple clicks to get down to the index, uh, but you can see what do they do? Okay, so they're saying that there's academic research that says high quality shares will perform better. And they're looking at three different factors, low financial leverage. So low financial leverage means they don't have a lot of debt. High return on equity. So return on equity is a measure of the return that a company is getting when they're investing in their business. We want companies, and return on equity is one, return on invested capital is another. We want companies that when they invest in the business to grow the business, that they earn really high returns, right? As your shareholder, you own this company. You want them to go out and borrow money at 5% and invest in whatever company they have, expanding production, hiring new employees, marketing more, building a new factory, whatever they're trying to do. We want them to earn really, really high returns on that because that eventually accrues to us. So we're looking at high return on equity and reliable earnings growth. So what reliable earnings growth and really what they're looking for here is that um, there are companies that are very cyclical. So you'll see those earnings bounce around a lot. They follow the economic cycle and the economy is doing really well. Those companies will do really well. Good example of this is generally basic material shares, right? When people are uh, feeling good about things, what are they doing? They're going out investing and building new buildings. They're building new factories. Basic materials are the ingredients going in there, right? Like iron ore to steel to buildings. So those are generally very cyclical companies and they will bounce around. The earnings will bounce around a lot. Things are going really well. Price of that commodity will go up. Companies will make more money. They're mining that commodity. The economy is doing really poorly. Nobody's building anything. Commodity prices will generally go down. And, uh, and the companies won't do it, it won't do as well. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but this ETF is looking for a reliable company or companies that have reliable earnings growth. So you're not seeing a lot of variation. So those are the three factors. We can see all three factors are equally weighted and they're putting a quality score on each security in this universe, this overall MISCI world universe. And they take 300 ranked securities, so the top 300. And then what they're doing is they're tilting this towards large companies again. So that's sort of a market capitalization weighted. Um, so yeah, you can see what they are doing. They've got certain restrictions on those um, so that you don't get a huge exposure to something. So I think Rodney wrote in that this is 75% exposed to the US. Well, that's not that out of line with what the global index is. So you see they've got uh, they've got some uh, some safeguards or guardrails around how far they can get. You can see Vanek rebalances this portfolio semi-annually. So why do they rebalance? Well, they rebalance, of course, to make sure it still falls within this criteria. And when you read rebalance, think you're gonna pay taxes. So generally rebalancing, of course, involves selling the winners, buying more of the losers, right? That's going to generate capital gains. Those will be passed on to you as an investor. So rebalancing is important, important to think about. I know we've got a question there where I will talk about rebalancing. Um, and you can see how our analysts think you should use this in the portfolio. We recommend using Qual as a supporting player, so not one of your larger holdings. Um, so that is understanding the criteria for security selection. Now, in this case, the criteria is a little more complicated because this is a factor ETF. I explained the AS2, ASX 200, but any index 
that's created. You know, these indexes did not come down from uh, from on high. They are created by people who write these rules, whether they've been around for 100 years or not. There are rules. So understand those rules um, is really important. And then they're talking, and we'll look at the composition in a second. Our analysts also do provide some commentary on, on the composition. So what? 10 holdings have 31.5% of the total assets as of that date last year. Largest holding, Apple. Unsurprising since Apple is uh, the largest holding in a lot of different indexes. You can see that is heavy sector tilt towards technology. Why is that? Well, for a couple different reasons. Tech companies generally generate a lot of cash, which means they don't need a lot of debt to fund them. So there goes low financial leverage. They meet that criteria. Generally, tech companies are very asset light. So they are very high returns on what they invest in the company. That's why people like tech shares, right? Because at the end of the day, they're very, very scalable, meaning that small investments in the company to grow the company can have tremendous rewards and reliable earnings growth. Tech companies are generally not cyclical. So they're not bouncing around with the economy. There are certainly exceptions, but you get that reliable growth. Um, that you're looking for. You can see a heavy tilt or a heavy sector tilt um, to technology. You can see where it is underweight. Energy, materials, which is basic materials and consumer discretionary. Why? Well, remember, we are trying to look for non-cyclical companies, companies that don't bounce around with the economy. Energy, price of oil to use as a proxy, although there are other parts of energy very influenced by economic growth. So the fortunes of those companies change on economic growth. Same thing with basic materials, which I talked about, consumer discretionary. Those are, of course, things we do not need, but we want. So when are we gonna go out and buy all the stuff we want? When we're feeling good about things, when we're in a stable job, when the market's up and we get that wealth effect. So you see all these are very cyclical. That's why they're very underweight. Uh, so yes. That is the exposure and how it plays out. And then let's look at this. We want to look at the portfolio. And we want to look at the portfolio for a couple different reasons. And I went in and just used our portfolio um, tab on this ETF. This is available both free on morningstar.com.au and, of course, on Investor. And we can see, okay, is this ETF, they tell us it's doing something, is the portfolio actually reflecting that? So... They say it's international. All right, well, there we go, 100% international. So they're doing that. What kind of shares is it investing in? Well, we've got value to growth, high quality companies. People generally pay more for high quality companies. So it makes sense that they are in growth. They have this reliable earnings growth. They don't have a lot of debt, less risky. People pay higher multiples for that. So growth, they're very large. That makes sense too, right? Because at the end of the day, smaller companies can struggle to gain a toehold and, uh, and can struggle with, uh, with getting their products adopted. So it makes sense. These are large companies with steady, reliable earnings growth, not a lot of debt. Makes sense. So we're getting growth large. That's the portfolio. We've got different factors. This is a quality ETF, so it's a good thing that it ranks very high on quality, but you can see other places where it ranks. Yield, yeah, they don't pay that high of dividends. We know we're tilted towards growth. These shares have done very well. If we sort of look at recent market history, so momentum, we know they're large. Liquidity, how much they're actually trading, volatility around right in the middle. Um, so that makes sense. We can go through, look at different measures so none of this is that surprising. I told you people pay more for quality. It makes sense that the price to earnings ratio is higher than the index um, and that all of our kind of valuation measures are higher than what the index is. That makes sense. Talked about how the dividend yield was lower than the index. Um, yeah, a lot of this makes sense. They're growing faster. All these growth categories they're growing earnings faster, sales faster, cash flow faster. So we expect from those reliable companies that are high quality. So 
all makes sense. And then the sectors, and this is kind of what our analysts were talking about, right? Big allocation to technology, very low allocation to, yeah, basic materials, real estate, all these things that tend to be more cyclical. Energy, we can compare it to the category, right, to see how this tracks with the overall index. So, you know, in this case, very much as I go through this ETF, what it says to me is, this isn't necessarily where it's a good or bad investment opportunity, but it says this ETF is doing what we think it's doing. Um, so you are getting what's on the label. And then finally, yeah, we want to look at top holdings. Uh, remember, our analyst report was from a little while ago, uh, 2022. Things have changed. NVIDIA has had a huge run. Um, but you can see, okay, what are the top 10 holdings? What are all these saying at the end of the day? Most of these are saying American technology, um, which is, uh, which of course makes sense kind of given what, uh, what we just read about the, uh, about the index. So those are really the steps and why it's really important to understand what you're actually buying with these ETFs and go beyond the label, right? Because remember, especially with the huge increase in thematic ETFs, that label is uh, yeah used as a marketing um, tool. And so it is important to go beyond just the label and, uh, and figure out what is in that ETF. Okay, so let's spend some time on some questions. So we did have one question about emerging market um, exposure. And so what we have in that aggressive portfolio is there's a 7% allocation to emerging markets, um, just so people are aware. So that is, uh, that's the exposure. But all right, let's go through some of these questions. We have a lot of questions. Um, all right, so we have a question from Jeff, and it's a good jumping off point. And uh, he asked about two ETFs, Uranium ETF and FANG. Um, so I think, uh, all of these ETFs, we just got the question, all of these ETFs, or maybe I'm missing, so I'll get back to that one. So this uranium and FANG. So this is a good time to talk about thematic ETFs. So you'll notice that on that list, there are no thematic ETFs. So a thematic ETF, and you know the definition of all this stuff is fairly fluid at the end of the day. So what I'm calling a factor ETF, maybe something call thematic. But kind of what I consider a thematic ETF is, okay, we aren't using characteristics of a company. What we are doing is we are trying to find companies that fit a certain theme. So, you know, obviously the uranium ETF, what theme are we trying to access there? Well, we're trying to access the fact that there's a lot of talk about uranium, um, the demand for uranium going up, and of course the price is going up and trying to identify companies that make their money off of uranium. The FANG ETF is, honestly, Jeff, you probably haven't been on here before, but it's one of my favorite ones to kind of make fun of. So the FANG ETF is, is I have some problems with it. Um, so the FANG ETF is looking at high growth um, high growth companies at the end of the day. It is tracking an index. The index is picked by people. It is an actively managed ETF. There's no other way to describe it. Um, like they've got this weird little index that's picked by people and then they say it's tracking an index, but it's picked by people. So they are trying to find these like technology growth stories. There are 10 securities in the ETF so you're not diversified. They rebalance the ETF quarterly, which means you are getting a ton of capital gains. So this is where if we're going through that process, we start thinking about, okay, um, how do we actually go in there and, uh, and understand the investments where we're investing in? The FANG ETF is actually a good example. A couple of years ago, it had this huge distribution. So distribution for an ETF is, of course, any dividends generated by the companies in the ETF and capital gains. And it had this huge distribution. And I read on all these message boards like, oh, this is incredible. It's such a great income producer. None of the securities in there paid a dividend. This is all capital gains. They're just distributing a tax bill to you um, because it's rebalanced quarterly because there's 10 securities in it. 
Um, so anyway, that's my little rant about Fang. Um, we've got a question, a good one from Ted, saying, what is your view on ETFs that are hedged? So if I go back into this presentation, you might notice, uh, if we go back to this original list, we've got some hedged ETFs in here. Anytime you see HDG, it means it's hedged. So what are they doing? It means it's a global ETF. They're removing the currency risk from that ETF. So what that means is that your return, if you invest in global shares, will be partially made up of how those shares do. Do they go up or down? Partially with how the Australian dollar does against whatever currency you're investing. If you're investing in the US, how the Australian dollar does against the US. Remember, if you're investing overseas, you want the Australian dollar to go down. That is positive for you. That adds to your return. Hedged ETFs remove that currency exposure. For almost every large index ETF, like this Vanguard Miski International, Miski International is the big global index, they will have a hedged version and an unhedged version. So, you know, in terms of in terms of my view, I will share, I guess, kind of the thinking that I think a lot of people um, have about these. The Australian dollar tends to trade in a bit of a range, particularly if you look against the US dollar. You know, it obviously exceeded the US dollar. It was a while ago now. But, uh, but yeah, generally will bounce down to the low 60s where it is now, maybe the high 50s. Um, so some people say, hey, now is a great time to buy a hedged investment because inevitably the Australian dollar will bounce back at, certain, at some point. Currency is really hard. So really what I tell people is, one, understand what hedging means and how that works. The other thing is think about how differences in the currency will impact your lifestyle. And I always use this example, but you know, I was in France a month ago, something like that. It was absurdly expensive because the Aussie dollar was so weak. So it's thinking about your life. If you're retired and you're traveling a lot, if you have expenses overseas, well, okay, a weak Aussie dollar is a problem for you. It's gonna make your travel a lot more expensive. So maybe in that case, you want a positive when the Aussie dollar is really low. And that positive is an unhedged version where at least your investments are going up. Your global investments are going up when the Aussie dollar is falling. So think about how this sort of would impact your life uh, more than trying to kind of gain the currency. Um, so I guess that would be my view on, uh, on hedged versus unhedged. Um, why, how have you selected those 14 ETFs to uh, form each portfolio type? Um, they are rated highly by our analysts. So basically what we did is we took that asset allocation. So we said, we think an investor in an aggressive portfolio should be 40% international. And then we went to our analysts and we said, okay, we need some global ETFs. What are your top rated ETFs? Our analysts rate ETFs, gold, silver, bronze, neutral, negative. Obviously gold, silver, bronze are the good ones. Neutral, don't really care. <laughs> negative, we think you should avoid them. So within each one of those sectors or those asset, al asset allocation buckets, it's based on our analyst rating. So you can go in and read those analyst ratings um, as well. Uh, the anonymous attendee says, any suggestions as to what to do when one suggested ETF is changed for another over time? Sell or just buy extra of the new recommended one? Um, listen, I think the question is which ETF it is and why was it removed? So the first thing I would do is I would go read the analyst report on that ETF. So it was most likely removed because our analyst opinion changed on it. Read why. Should you sell? I'm not a big believer. <laughs> I'm a believer in avoiding selling as much as possible. But if anyone read my article about that Warren Buffett quote earlier this week, you'll see why this has been a mistake for me in the past. But if there's a way to avoid selling, if there's some sort of tax consequence, um, yeah, read the ETF. If an say it's awful, get out of it, then yeah, maybe you consider selling. If they just say, oh, we actually like this one better because the expenses are slightly lower 
Well, maybe then you'd sit there and say, okay, well, I'll wear those slightly higher expenses because I am uh, not going to generate all these capital gains if I sell. So very much based on your own um, circumstances. Uh, so we've got a question about the Indian market. Um, so I don't specifically know. So the question is about IIND, um, thicker symbol, I assume that's just an Indian, um, just an Indian uh, index that's being tracked. Um, so a lot of people are talking about India. A lot of people are talking about India in terms of um, certainly the economic growth that you're seeing in India. And I'm not the one to ask about this. I will say that our investment management group um, likes China more than India, um, just because China, they believe, is really cheap. Um, you know, I think, once again, my own personal opinion, I would invest in China, um, but they're far smarter than I am. Um, but just when I think about my own portfolio and my goals, and I think the long-term underperformance of the Chinese equity market and the political or geopolitical risk, could be, I would invest in China. That's a personal opinion based on my goals and what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, you know, I tilt more towards income. You don't get a lot of income out of China. So that's a personal opinion. But I will just say that analysts do think that India is expensive. Um, so Rodney says, I must admit, I was quite skeptical of Morningstar's recommendation weighting to MVW so that it is an equal weighted ETF. Um, understand the why. However, I was concerned that being equal weight would have poor tax consequences with lots of distributed capital gains, et cetera, like FANG, but to a lesser degree. Recently, I see some research looked at what actually happened, and it was apparently quite minimal, so I changed my mind. Okay, so what Rodney is talking about is that an equal weighted index, as I talked about, is that the Australian market's very, very heavily weighted towards financials, the banks, and basic materials. An equal weighted ETF gives you more of a distribution across different sectors. It also lowers your exposure to those large companies because we're putting an equal amount of money, half a percent in all 200 of the ASX 200. What he's talking about is in order to keep that weighting, of course, the portfolio needs to be rebalanced that generates capital gains. Um, so yes, those are all considerations. Um, sort of looking at what are the good things you potentially get? Um, and then what are the negative things? So really good statement, um, Rodney. All right, so we've got a question. Is it better to select an ETF with 40 companies versus trying to track the index? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously a hypothetical question. What 40 companies are in the ETF? Um, just remember, I guess, just remember that an index, while they have a lot of potential companies in them, a lot of them are very top heavy. Um, so, you know, people that keep sitting there, and yes, you technically own bits of 200 companies if you buy the ASX 200. Like 100 of them don't matter at all. They could triple, it would have no effect on your ETF because there's such a small allocation um, to those uh, to those ETFs. Um, so yeah, it kind of depends upon what that those 40s are. Um, okay, so Craig says, what benchmarks are used to judge the performance of ETFs? Okay, yeah, in ETF, the way that we do it at Morningstar, just like when we're looking at funds, um, every ETF will go into a category. So, and you'll be able to see that category. And those are the indexes we use to track them. So if you are investing in uh, that quality ETF, right? So they are starting with the MISCI global index. So a large global developed market index. And they are just picking companies out of that index that are quality. We would use that MISCI index to benchmark that against and saying, okay, does this quality tilt? Is it adding positive returns or not? All right, so that's what we would use to benchmark it. So every ETF would be classified, just like every fund would be classified in one of these categories. Um, Lisa says, if two or three different firms offer ETFs all with the same basic structure, like the ASX 200, does one choose which ETF to add to our portfolio based purely on the lowest fee? Yes, unless there's something very wrong with the ETF. So when we are looking at an index ETF, 
And the ASX 200 is a perfect example because there are multiple um, ETFs that track that. If we talk about the ASX 300, which basically does the same thing because of a small allocation to the little shares, um, we would look at fees. The other thing we'd look at is tracking error. Now, tracking error basically says, does that ETF track the index? What is the gap? There's always going to be a little bit of tracking error. Right? It's always because you have to go out there and buy these things. And, you know, there's obviously some human intervention. We take it for granted. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Tracking error on a big index is generally very, very small. But that's the other thing we look at. Something like the ASX 200, you wouldn't really run into tracking error with error with any of those uh, with any of those um, indexes. So, yeah, I would look at fees. Um, and that's why you see for some of those, there's like kind of this fee war where they keep lowering the fees, which obviously benefits us. Um, we've already had the hedge question. Okay, so Angelo says, is there a big difference for this quality ETF and moat or goat ETF? Okay, so let me, uh, let me talk. So there is a moat ETF. Um, it uses Morningstar analyst ratings or equity analyst ratings for companies that uh, for companies that we believe have a sustainable competitive advantage or moat because it would be a conflict of interest because Morningstar sells that index, we don't rate it. Um, so that's why I don't really ever talk about it. But what I would do is I go through that same exercise of looking at how that index, how the securities are picked to go into that index. And you can see basically it's Morningstar moat ratings. It is then like making sure that it doesn't get too out of whack with the overall index in terms of sector exposure, et cetera. Um, so yeah, those would be the differences. So it would, it is a person, they are people, analysts, I keep pointing over there because they sit over there, analysts that are coming up with those sustainable competitive advantage or moat ratings versus an ETF that is just looking at the characteristics of that company. So more of a quant focus on that, uh, that um, those different qualities that we talked about. Um, all right, so question on hedge versus unhedged ETF. I think I answered this one. If we anticipate the AUD is going to strengthen over time against the US dollar, it's better to invest in hedged ETF or unhedged ETF. Okay, so remember, if the Aussie dollar strengthens, that is bad for us if we're invested in US dollar assets. We want the Aussie dollar to go down. So if the Aussie dollar goes up, that takes away from returns. It would be better to be in a hedged portfolio. Um, so yeah, for you that answers that. Well, I provide a copy of my slides. Absolutely, just email me. All right, got a good question here. Uh, is now a good time to buy bond ETFs, assuming interest rates will stay high for another six to 12 months. Okay, bond ETFs. Um, I've got a good article. Well, I don't know if it's good. I wrote an article. You can have it if you'd like to email me, David. Um, yeah, we got to be careful with bond ETFs. Uh, and we got to be careful just that you have the right mentality around what a bond ETF is. So remember, a bond ETF, people have been talking about bonds a lot now because, of course, interest rates are higher. People think, and it's true, okay, you buy a bond, you get a certain amount of interest. That's great. Um, and that's when you're buying a bond and you're holding it to maturity. An ETF is a basket of bonds. So all the time, that basket still has securities that were issued a while ago and interest rates are lower. It's buying new ones, things mature, it buys new ones. So it's this living and breathing portfolio. The biggest influence on the return of that bond ETF is where interest rates go. If interest rates stay the same level, you are not going to get any sort of tailwind, right? Because when interest rates go down, bond prices go up, bond ETFs go up. When interest rates go up, those ETFs go down. So bond ETFs, if you go look at how they've done over the past couple of years, it's been terrible. They've done terrible. They're down 20% or so because, of course, interest rates went up. So the only way you can get your money back, nothing matures, you have to sell that ETF. Um, so, yeah, you need to figure out where interest rates are going to go. Having interest rates just hold steady, maybe you do okay. But if you're saying the next six to 12 months, you frankly probably do better if you just went and bought a term deposit um, over that short time period, unless you think interest rates are gonna go down, then that ETF would go up. Um, 
Let's see what else. Uh, somebody said, can I get Rodney to help me build my portfolio? Yeah, um, <laughs> absolutely. I'm volunteering your, uh, your time, Rodney. So, all right, let's see what's in the chat. Um, what do we say? Uh, okay, so somebody uh, somebody has a question about stop losses. Um, and basically the question is, is that something that you don't recommend with with long-term ETF investing? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess kind of my question about a stop loss would be what are you trying to accomplish by that? Um, and, you know, if there's like an absolute floor that you don't want your portfolio to go through, maybe that would be something that, that you could do personally, because I'm a very long-term investor, I believe that over the long term that, you know, markets will go up. And what would I do if it actually hit that stop loss? Like, I guess in a perfect world, I would sit there and keep the cash and then buy when the market's lower, but how am I going to know when to buy? So I, I wouldn't personally use one just because of my investment goals. If you are maybe transitioning into retirement, maybe a stop loss would make more sense. So I think it's just saying, okay, what are you trying to accomplish with that stop loss? How does that align with what you're trying to accomplish with your portfolio? Um. Uh, are they domiciled to Australia? They all trade in Australia. Um, so all the ETFs are model portfolios. They all trade on Australian exchanges. Uh, so Rod says, Morningstar provides a very useful rating, e.g. gold, et cetera. Can you please discuss how this should be viewed? Um, yeah, it depends. It depends what type of ETF you're looking for. If we have a gold rating or high rating on an actively managed ETF, our view is that that ETF will beat the market over the long term. We have confidence in those managers that are selecting the securities that they will beat the market over the long term. And there's a lot of research around how gold ETFs do a lot better than silver and bronze and neutral, et cetera. So I think our analysts do a decent job. If you're looking at a gold rating on a passive ETF, well, that's very, very different, right? Because a passive ETF that's tracking a broad-based index can't beat that index. Um, so what that means is we think that that is an excellent way for you to get exposure to that index. Um, so that's what uh, that's how you should use those ratings. Uh, yeah, Sean says, what's your view on Baz? Um, our, uh, our analysts think very highly of it. Um, low fee, uh, like Vanguard. So yeah, we do have a high rating on Baz, which I believe is Australia's most popular um, ETF. So we've got a question uh, saying cash flow discount method with ETF. So what we're talking about here is a discounted cash flow model, which is how we would, um, which is how we would, uh, value, how an analyst would value a share. An ETF does not have a discounted cash flow, but of course the companies in it would have a discounted cash flow. Um, so, you know, as far as I know, I guess you could try to figure it out yourself um, that, you know, we don't provide that information. We don't roll those up to ETFs because ETFs always changing, right? So as company goes up and price down and price, if it's market cap weighted, it would change. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting to look at maybe stuff like relative valuation measures, price to earnings, things like that. Not necessarily to say something is good or bad, but just that example that we use with the quality ETF saying, okay, people pay more for high quality shares. Does this ETF contain more expensive shares? Well, yeah, it does from a price to earnings ratio, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily bad. Um, but just to kind of sense check that portfolio. Okay, Mick, um, we'll talk about your situation. Um, yeah, I mean, shoot me an email. I can't tell you what to invest in or how to invest, but yeah, I can point you towards some different literature. Um, market timing. I don't exactly know what that question is, Richard. Are you taking into account market timing? Currently, the market is not rising. Um, yeah, no, the market's not doing well. Um, right, uh, right now, um, we are not. So in terms of we are not 
there is no change in those ETF model portfolios, it always follows that strategic asset allocation. There's nobody sitting there saying, hey, I don't think the market's going to do very well. We're going to raise that aggressive. We're going to temporarily go 30% cash. Um, so no, all we are doing is saying, we think over the long term, you should have, as an example, 40% allocated to global equities. Here are the ETFs that we would have you consider to get that global equity exposure. Nobody's saying the market looks cheap, expensive. We have an investment team that does that in the portfolios that they manage for clients, but that's not the purpose of this ETF model portfolio. Um, sorry, I'm so going through, I know I've passed time. Another person wants you to help build the portfolio. Ronnie, I think you've got yourself a job. Um, don't capital gains offset capital losses in a rebalance? Not necessarily. Remember, a rebalance will happen. Let's say the market goes up 20% the next year. Some shares will go up more than other shares. So if you're an equal weighted in ETF, maybe all 200 shares in the ASX 200 go up. Well, there's no losses, right? So even when you're selling off, those companies that are out of whack and no longer equal weighted, there are no losses. There's nothing you're selling that has a loss. You're just looking at the relative winners, which you're selling and putting that back into still winners, but just not as high as the other one. So there are a lot of situations. And there's also situations, right? If the market goes down, that rebalancing could potentially be selling losers and you could get capital losses. But yeah, everything can, uh, yeah, everything can go up. Yeah, so hopefully I answered that bond ETF one. When's a good time when interest rates are going to go down? Um, is a good time. Uh, question, VHY, invest, franking credits. Yes, anytime you buy an ETF, if you are an Australian and you're buying an ETF that invests in Australian companies, those franking credits will get passed through to you. Um, so you do get franking credits. Um Uh, some people are saying thank you. So that's uh, that's nice. Uh, does an index following ETF have a price? Um, so you're looking at the net asset value, I think is the question. Yeah, absolutely. So you'll see that. Uh, you can certainly see that in the performance. So the ETF is designed, the whole point of the vehicle is that it is designed to not have a big, difference between the net asset value of the shares that are hold, held in it and the ETF price. Um, but yeah, there'll be a little bit of a difference. There are times to buy ETFs and not buy ETFs. Generally, we say don't buy in the morning, let the market, quote unquote, wake up a little bit. Um, and that will shrink that. But generally with ETFs, especially big ETFs, it's very, very small, that difference. Um, yep. Yeah. So that's what Rodney's saying, the market maker. So yeah, there's this mechanism in place to keep those very close. Um, all right, I think I got through everything. Anyway, sorry that this ran over. Um, I need to, uh, I guess I'm going to dinner. Um, but anyway, thank you guys very much for, uh, for joining. Shoot me an email if you'd like a copy of those ETF model portfolios. Um, and uh, yeah, that... Uh, that's about it or any other questions you have. All right. Thank you guys very much for joining. This video has been prepared for clients of Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or New Zealand Wholesale clients of Morningstar Research Limited. Any general advice has been provided without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.